welcome to Hexter Cafe. Uh, I'm Alex Glow with Hexter, and this is Miss Mitch Altman, my fantastic guest. Um, it's not actually a Tuesday. Uh, we we're recording this uh, previously. We we're but, cheating. Yeah, we're cheating. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it'll be awesome anyway. Um, so you are a co-founder of Where We Are, Noise Bridge, Hackerspace in San Francisco. Um, this is the second uh, location it's had, right? Yeah. Um, and Mitch is also a member of the international uh, hacker community. You're uh, on the organizing board for Hope, which is coming up in July. That was, yeah! that was the, the Pope before this one. Uh, <clears throat> why, so it says 2600, is that um, related with the hacking organization, the magazine and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. the people who put on Hope. Awesome. And I've been helping since 2008. Awesome. And it stands for Hackers on Planet Earth, right? Yeah, Hackers on Planet Earth. Is it mostly for computer are. people? It's mostly for people on planet Earth. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's very diverse. So there's uh, it started off being more um, security and starting with 2600. That's a phone freaking term from way back when. So phone freaking. and uh, But it's gotten very, very diverse, very much like uh, chaos communication congresses in, uh -huh. in, in Germany. Where we've both been. Uh, so I they really haven't been to the Congress, but I have been oh, to the uh, Yeah, I was gonna go two years ago and blow stuff up with my brain, but I couldn't get my passport to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know, but, but you were just there. Yeah, I was just there. It was fantastic. Uh, that's grown to 12,500 people. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. And um, but so I, I helped set up uh, the hardware hacking area, which is now like 20,000 square feet of people making things. And that's awesome. only one teeny little corner. And people have this huge embroidery set up and people have things making with, of course, 3D printers and laser cutters and I teach people to solder. And a lot of people are doing all sorts of amazing things. And then there are other parts of it where people are doing music and art and craft Sweet. of all sorts. And same with Hope, except it's in New York City every two years and uh the next one's coming up in july you should go <laughs> yeah i'd love to definitely if it works out and we first met when you were teaching people to solder in ann arbor michigan like yeah years ago. so cool uh so you're doing this tour and it's sort of a large part of what you do you'll also make the tv be gone uh, which is is that your most popular kit uh yeah yeah my most popular kit is tv be gone by far mm -hmm. I, I, I have a whole bunch of open hardware kits that I use for teaching soldering. Yeah. Um, mine and other friends that do open hardware, like Jimmy Rogers and mm -hmm. Evil Net Scientist and Little Fruit. Cool. So you're discontinuing one of, if you're watching this, you have a short window of time left to grab. Now, which version of the TV Be Gone is right, it? So TV Be Gone is how I've made a living uh, yeah. for the last 11 years. Uh -huh. uh, it's, you know, this is this one. I've got other things to show too, but definitely, um, definitely. we got things to show this is the today one. with toys. But uh, yeah, it. so the keychain is the original version, and um, it's just got a little button, and you push it, and uh, and then this thingy here is invisible light, but I think you'll be able to see it on this camera. Yeah, oh, hey, cool. kind of see it. Um, that's putting out off codes for TVs, awesome. and um, uh, yeah, and I've got them covered for the entire planet. And I've sold a, a half a million of these, which uh -huh. is kind of crazy. So but, is, ooh, yeah, so, uh, but I'm stopping that one. Mm -hmm. The kit is still popular for my workshops. I've sold a few tens of thousands of them, oh. though, um, helping people to learn to solder. And, and did you design your own PCB for that? Uh, originally, yeah. So right now, Adafruit makes them for uh -huh. me, and she did the uh, PC board for that. Cool. What did you use when you originally, did you do them by hand or? No, uh, <laughs> the first ones, yeah. 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 I mean, when I did prototypes. Uh -huh. um, so uh, but that was in 2003 and I wanted one for me. Yeah. And uh, my friends wanted them and then their friends and then friends of friends. And I thought <laughs> I'm gonna make a bunch of these and give them to the world. And uh -huh. I didn't really think it'd be that popular, but um, yeah, I've sold a half a million. It's how it made a living. It's yeah. pretty cool. So what else did you bring along? I've got this NeuroDreamer mask, which is uh, a uh, for inducing sleep states, including like lucid dreaming. It does the, uh, the LED flashing in your eyes, and it also gives you um, audio to help you uh, reach certain levels of, uh, of sleep stages. Unfortunately for me, when I tried it out, uh, I 
apparently always rip things off my face in my sleep. So unfortunately, oh, um, you broke yours? No, I just it always I would wake up with it on the pillow next to me oh. or like on the floor because apparently when I'm asleep I go like get this well, okay, as long as it <laughs> <your sleep. laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's great for like traveling. We were camping at EMF camp when I first tried this out. Um, and you so, gave a talk with that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, had a sweet little chat with, with people. Um, and I had a couple of friends try it there too, and they loved it. So, uh, and so what's what's powering this thing? Yeah, so NeuroDreamer um, sleep mask. So it, it uses um, uh, fading lights, fading in and out lights that mm -hmm. fade in and out at four separate brainwave frequencies. Mm -hmm. And then the sound of um, the speakers that are here uh, have different frequencies so that as it plays along, those have frequencies, the differences of which are the same as the fading in and out frequencies, uh -huh. which are the brainwave frequencies. And that follows a 20 minute brainwave sequence you can program for, yeah, and it's for helping you fall asleep. It, uh -huh. It's uh, corresponding to a recording of someone falling asleep who falls asleep well. Uh -huh. So awesome. Yeah, and the hardware is super simple. It's just uh -huh. a microcontroller of four LEDs in each eye and mm -hmm. a speaker in each ear and two low-pass filters. So. And it can make a sort of similar thing. So the binaural beats is the thing you're talking about with the ears, right? Yeah, that's the, yeah. Binaural beats. That's because uh, the brainwave frequencies are too low to actually hear. Yeah. So when you have one pitch here and another pitch here, the difference is the actual brainwave frequency. And uh, so I go through that, and it's actually co somewhat complex to create those in a pleasing way. Uh -huh. So I have an eight yeah. voice polyphonic music synthesizer in my huh. uh, microcontroller. Cool. Yeah, they would always give me headaches. Um, like when I would listen to you know recordings that are supposed to have binaural stuff. That uh, I made one in Pure Data that's just the tones, and that seemed to do better for some reason. I think because mm -hmm. like it doesn't matter what frequencies you use as long as the interval between them. So if, you, if I pick like lower ones, it felt better, I guess. Oh, good. Um, I don't know. Everyone's different. Does this give you a headache? I uh, know. Oh, good. Uh, no, yeah, it was really comfortable. I give you, make you no. <laughs> no, this is really comfy, especially like, you know, the, all the padding and stuff. It's great. Um, so is this project still going? How is it, how is yeah, kind of. When I made yeah. these, uh, I had a Kickstarter that was successful, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, fulfilled all the orders, and everyone seemed to be happy enough. Congrats. Uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was intense, but there were a lot of problems along the way, mm -hmm. like everyone has whenever you do a project, and Kickstarters are often late. Uh, mine was late, but uh, I fulfilled them all. But then I started having problems with the batteries. The batteries I chose, it turns oh. out, they um, if if they if they make it to the end customer, they're they're fine. But uh -huh. if they make it to the end customer and it's too cold then they never charge. So, oh, no. uh, yeah, so. Would that happen along the way? Or? Yeah, they're uh, lithium, not regular lithium polymer, uh -huh. but LIPFEO4, which seem to be totally uh, advantageous in so many ways. Uh -huh. They have more recharge cycles. They uh, last longer uh, per charge, and they charge faster. Yeah. Um, but uh, I found out why they're not used everywhere, and that's because if they get cold, they don't recharge. <laughs> and when you ship something in an airplane, it's pretty cold. Yeah, man. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So anyways, because of that, I never really pushed them. Mm -hmm. um, so, But they've been selling anyways on the website. Cool. And then you, you have another one that also uh, deals with sensory phenomena. It seems like I have never, we've never talked about this, but it, yeah. from this and the fact that you've done the trip glasses, uh, it seems like this is an area of curiosity for you. Uh, what, are, what is your fascination with sensory um, development? Yeah. Well, I've been um, playing with uh, brainwave stuff since I was uh, undergrad. Uh -huh. So uh, at the University of Illinois, where I went to, there was uh, a lab that did a lot of brainwave research. Uh -huh. uh, it was, uh, there was a whole bunch of cutting edge stuff there dealing with trying to explore what consciousness is and mm -hmm. physiological psychology. So uh, that fascinated me too, and it still does. And I was a guinea pig there, and I would, back then <laughs> they had the like, super glue electrodes to your... I did one of those, a sleep study, and they like, you know, it took a couple yeah. hours, they played like nature documentaries. I don't know, did you get to watch videos? No, we didn't have that. <laughs> uh, but they, they did these tests and um, trying to see 
what happens with your brain waves as you're learning, as you're uh, falling asleep, as yeah. you're going into meditation, as you're waking up, all these different things. So, uh, yeah, and I saw through that, and I've been meditating since I was a little kid, and I saw through that that um, how the brain waves correlate with going in and out of these various states, like mm -hmm. falling asleep or being awake or being alert, being kind of groggy, um, being in meditation, getting to meditation, all these things. Yeah. So, um, you know, and it, it started really for me with uh, a fascination with, uh, you know, consciousness. We all think we have it. and. <laughs> you know, it seems we do, and uh, yeah. but what is it? You know, you can't point to it, you can't touch yeah. it. Um, and there's all those arguments about teleportation, and if you create another version of yourself and then destroy it, can you actually port your consciousness to that one, or is it just like... Or is it automatically ah! there? And, you know, and this yeah. is uh, certainly just a thought experiment at this point. Uh -huh. um, you know, and I don't know, we could, we could, I could rant about that because uh, uh, the whole singularity thing is something I'm way not into. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, according to... Uh, you don't want to be uploaded? I don't want to be uploaded. No, I want to live my <laughs> life to the best that I can while I'm alive. Yeah. And, uh, and when I'm dead, I'm dead. That's okay. It's fine. I'll make room for someone else. But... Um, uh, but while I'm alive, I'm going to live my life to the fullest. Hell yeah! Uh, be as happy and healthy as I can be. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, uploading a brain is necessarily, according to uh, the high priest Kurzweil, um, a <laughs> destructive process. Oh, yeah. And he says that it doesn't matter, though, because you're actually reproduced in the computer and it's not a copy of you, it is you. Yeah. And it's actually a copy. I don't and agree you're with dead. that. Yeah, I don't agree with that either. Well, in Kurzweil, I founded Singularity University, and that's where I saw Aubrey de Gertel, who is this person who's really focused on longevity. And he himself said that, you know, he's interested in researching life extension for other people, but he's not going to be a guinea pig because he doesn't want to suffer, like, you know, the effects of being a beta tester. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a lot worse than, you know, uh, binaural beats headaches. It's going to be <laughs> probably in like like using brainwaves for our benefit for yeah. uh, you know meditating easier or learning how to sleep when you're stressed out. Definitely That's not very invasive. Um, you know, I think it can be a benefit. But I mean, whatever people want to do, I don't want to tell people what to do and what not. Yeah, do. right. Um, I just know what what um, uh, I know at this point, mm -hmm. and I'm certainly open to changing my thoughts and opinions as I go along, and that's why I remain as happy and healthy as I can be as I live. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so anyways, um, uh, I, I really don't care how long I live. Uh, I'm totally fine. I mean, I don't really want to get hit by a bus so no, I, yeah. as I walk home, but if I do, I, I, I'm happy that I lived my life. I think that's, yeah, that's partly why we're in this in this line of work, right? Is freedom and, and getting to create stuff that supposedly helps other people. I mean, yours does. Mine is like, I've, I've done a bit of playing with EEG as well, like doing, like triggering a little helicopter to go if you focus on it. So like you can like train yourself to produce different states, but um, it's not going to be super advantageous for humanity as a whole, I think. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe a helicopters in the way. Doing stuff that you think is awesome, I think is the best thing for you to do. Yeah. And I think it's the best thing for everyone to do, you know, what they think is awesome. Yeah. And they make, yeah. I mean, right now we live on a planet where too many people are doing things they know isn't awesome. Yeah, yeah. And that's really, really sad. Uh, but if everyone were doing things they thought were really wonderful, uh, if everyone did that, we'd yeah. have an incredible planet. Uh, I don't know if that's even possible. Uh, probably not. Oh, yeah. But we all have the option to try. Yeah. And the more yeah. people that are doing that, I think the better the world gets. Yeah. Definitely, uh, I was inspired to branch out from the more tech support sort of boring ways of things by some mutual friends who are like professional musicians and showed me that it can be done. Yeah. So, yeah. so what kind of goodies did you bring? I brought things that I uh, teach What's people exciting in the bag? soldering with. Um, so uh, I haven't opened this in a while since I've been traveling around the world. Oh, so you could um, be surprised too. So let's see. These are stickers and cards and stuff. And headphones and uh, more stickers. <laughs> you must have actual... quite the sticker collection. I do. Travel. So not only is much involved with hope, but also um, let's see. Uh, what else? You bring all kinds of stuff. Uh, you do your animal China trip, right? Yeah. So every year I bring a people, uh, a, a group of people to China with me. 
and we visit uh, manufacturers so mm -hmm. you can see how things are manufactured. So most people don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, geeks like us know how to design things, uh -huh. but it's a long way from a design to an actual product that you can buy. And the person who builds it. Oh, people who build yeah. it. And uh, you know, like this is about as simple a project, a uh, hardware project as you can make. Uh -huh. It's just a microcontroller, a couple lights and battery and a, and a board and that's it. Mm -hmm. And yet getting from the prototype to the finished product in a package with barcode and all that stuff uh, mm -hmm. on pallets ready to go is quite a journey. So um, most people don't know how that works and it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And seeing all the machines and the people and the way they do it is just really, really cool. So I thought it would be really great to show people how that works and also for people who are interested in it, mm -hmm. they can have a project they think is way cool that they worked on and bring it into the world if they want to. On the trip you did some of that? Oh, it's super cool! Oh, uh, maybe I should go this year. <laughs> we should definitely go. Yeah, we'll probably go in about October. Uh -huh. uh, and anyone, anyone, everyone's welcome. If you want to, just just search for a hacker trip to China <laughs> noise bridge, and you'll find a, a page for it. So um, and that's right before the Shenzhen Maker Fair in November, so people could stay over. The, the I think so. I think the Shenzhen oh, Maker Fair is in April. Oh, I'm probably see wrong. If I can go. I would April, trust you. But. You. but um, uh, yeah, and then we visit uh, hackerspaces and we help schools set up hackerspaces and right now China is going on a rampage setting up hackerspaces everywhere. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And they awesome. don't know what hackerspaces are so they want us to go and show them. <laughs> uh -huh. and we've had lots of delegations of Chinese people, administrators and education people as well, as well as municipal people come to check out an anarchist hackerspace in the United States <laughs> to see how to do a hackerspace well in China. That's I think awesome. that's really cool. So um, <laughs> yeah, and there's been several of these and more to come. Uh -huh. uh, so I've given lots of talks uh, around the world, but in China about how to do that. And mm -hmm. So our group, as we go around, it's a diverse group, all sorts of different people yeah. going for their own motivations, but we give presentations as people want to. It's not required, but a lot yeah. of people like that. And we try to encourage Chinese people to be a little less timid about trying new things since the culture hasn't really been so open, mm. certainly in the last few decades, but really ever. And yeah. This is an unprecedented time there for opening up like, like amazing ways. Mm. So um, yeah, and I love being able to help and people on the trip uh, help as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, everything we have comes from China. So yeah, it's yeah, cool absolutely. to go there and, and we also get shown around by local geeks. So. That's right. That's one of my favorite things about being part of a hackerspace is that you can say, well, I'm from Noisebridge. Where are you from? Like, you can say just not just like San Francisco. A lot of people do know about Noisebridge because it's one of the more famous okay. ones. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like Seabase and Noisebridge are kind of like the rock star hackerspaces. Yeah, Seabase <laughs> being the first. Yeah. Um, but it get, definitely gives you sort of a, a verbal passport wherever you want to like go and hang out with people. Um, not that you necessarily need one. You, know, you can always just walk in and say, yeah. "Hey!" You or can, look if up you the. Want to yeah. Have. You can have a hackerspace passport. <laughs> a hackerspace passport. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you don't need these to go to uh, uh, hackerspaces, but it's kind of fun yeah. to have one. And the the plans for this is all open source too. You can download the artwork and print your own. And uh, you can put your your photo in there, and uh, and then collect um, stamps from hackerspaces around the world. This is the the first one that I made. Now they actually do sell them. Uh, Adafruit has them, and so does Spark Fun and uh, Seed Studio. Whoa! Of course, Seed Studio, being Chinese, um, makes the coolest ones. And uh, you know, and it's of course. Uh, Nice you know, with my picture in it also. <laughs> His Packers faces around the world. And, uh, yeah. So anyways, um, unlike <laughs> these things where you have to have one to go out of a border, which is kind of silly, but <laughs> such is our world as it is. Yeah, traveling with technology is no like cakewalk either. Like I usually put a note in my, mm. if I have to check something, I put a note in saying like, this is what this stuff is, this is what I'm doing. And like, even, you know, we usually get pulled aside. Do you have any strategies for that? What do you do? Or do you I, just deal with it and like- I don't stay? bring anything on the plane uh -huh. except the normal things that people carry mm. on the planes. Cause uh, you know, these people, uh, whatever. I mean, we live in a weird world yeah. and, um, you know, and we have security theater at every border 
And it's not for our security, it's to make people feel like they're security. And, uh, so you just see it as performance art, like? Uh, yeah, except it's not good art, but no. whatever. It's, it's, <laughs> it's but shitty we, performance we art. have to be part of it, too. Uh -huh. And we play our roles in it. Uh, so I just bring normal thing. The people doing their jobs there, if they see something they don't understand, then they have to do something different, and yeah. they don't know how to do that. So I don't make them do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, fair yeah. enough. So uh, anything weird I put in my bag, and. I don't actually leave notes, mm. um, and my bag's full, full of weird stuff, you know, <laughs> you know boards of thingies mm. and uh, a whole bag of, of stuff, and, yeah. um, uh, oops, and, uh, oops, <laughs> 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 this stuff is falling all over the place here, so excuse Exciting us, interview. but, um, uh, yeah, so I don't give them stuff on the airplane to deal with, but the people who x-ray they always leave a little love note saying hey we oh, opened yeah. your bag and look and yeah. everything was fine so yeah that one time i was trying to get to germany i had two pi two pinatas one pinata but to fit it because that's what we we're going to explode on stage but I had, in order to fit in the bag i had to cut the head off it and i was like i should probably make an extra effort to try and be friendly yeah. for me yeah, I didn't expect to be able to find one, so like capacitors, we were going to just like hook up a capacitor backwards and blow it up with brand waves, it was going to be fantastic, but uh, was it? <laughs> what? Was it? Well, I wasn't able to get over there, so uh, we tried to do it with fireworks over here, but it wasn't as exciting. <laughs> so, brain waves are more exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. I, I Less loud pee. <laughs> so what? What is this thing? It looks like a synthesizer of some type. It Actually, like that's exactly what it is. And that's my inspiration was oh, cool. <laughs> um, so um, you know, like I said, the uh, the Neuro Dreamer, I programmed it to be a um, uh, an eight voice polyphonic music synthesizer. Right. And I've been playing with music for a long, long time too. In fact, that was my master's thesis a long time ago. Oh, cool. So, uh, so I'm pretty good with microcontrollers and using them for um, digital signal processing for audio. Uh -huh. And pulling some tricks, you can do lots of pretty amazing sounds and noises and even music mm -hmm. um, with low powered microcontrollers. Like the one in um, NeuroDreamer. Yeah. And like the one in Arduinos. So this is uh, my latest project that I'm still working on. It's a uh, Arduino compatible music synthesizer. So right here is cool. the Arduino. Yeah, you've got like and a Here's a speaker and an audio amp. Uh, see it in the video, a speaker and an audio amp. And then um, here is just pads on the PC board shaped like a keyboard, mm -hmm. like the xylophone. And uh, I was originally thinking that I could have a, a chord with a, a stylus and then play it that way. But then I saw that people had figured out how to make input pins on the microcontroller for an Arduino Ooh. capacitive sense. Yeah, awesome. Thing. So you just poke it? Yeah, and unfortunately now this one isn't programmed to um, do that. Uh -huh. But um, uh, I do have something programmed in here, I think. Ooh. Yeah. So I don't know, can you hear it? I can't really hear it. Oh, yeah, it is that. Oh. Uh-huh. And oh. uh, there's... Uh... Cool. Huh? And uh, the idea is this is just making sound, um, and it's not uh, playable right now. If I hook a computer up to the, um, the USB port, then I can oh. control it through a, um, a computer laptop keyboard but that's kind of cumbersome. Yeah. The idea is to be able to play it here and also to have these knobs and make sounds and use it as performance. I also have these little buttons and touch mm -hmm. sensors so you can make squawking noises or whatever. Um, so the main idea of this is, and I call it r touch ah. synthesizer. So, you know, r touch uh, touch sensitive Arduino synthesizer. Um, it actually has really good quality sound with pulse width modulation and you can hear it uh, with higher quality from the um, headphone jack here, or use that as a line out. And um, uh, so it has the firmware pre-programmed in it, and you solder it together, a total beginner, and then you, it works. Mm -hmm. But if you want to learn about how to use digital signal processing to uh, make audio, then you can download, you know, look at the, the sketch, the Arduino uh -huh. sketch program, 
and look at the documentation there and learn about it. And we'll have modules and a library for swapping out synthesizers to be additive, subtractive, FM synthesis, wavetable, all these different kinds of synthesis. So have people already been uh, <clears throat> creating their own open source sketches for this? Not yet. This is a totally new project. Whoa, and cool. um, it's open source, but I haven't really released anything yet because this uh -huh. is still way too early. But uh, yeah. My first workshop is going to be at the University of Illinois later this month. I'll be hacker in residence there for a ah, month. cool. And I'm going to give this workshop there. That sounds awesome. And, uh, and then um, I'll have it in a state where I can at least start putting stuff on my GitHub, which is uh, unfortunately rather empty. But if anyone's interested, <laughs> Maltman23 is my GitHub and everything else. Um, there's really nothing there at the moment, though. Uh -huh. It seems like sourcing the right speakers is a big challenge for this kind of project, like for these as well. Like if you have a great controller, but then, you know, you've got these just little tinny things. So are these the same type of speakers or is this a different This type? is exactly the same speaker as in here. Oh. And it took me a while to find the speakers mm -hmm. for these that I liked. Yeah, imagine. So uh, what did you find? Uh, these are these them? are decent headphone speakers. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I, when I it took me two, I go to China for a month at a time, and uh, so two different trips to China, I tried a whole bunch of speakers for headphones that I could find and tried them all out, and these are the ones I like the best. Cool. Yeah, and they're for a decent price. It doesn't have to be super high quality because. You know, on the little synthesizer board, it's just for hearing and not so much for the high quality part. Yeah. For here, I want it to be high quality. So uh, it's because it has to be pleasing for you to fall, to fall asleep. Uh -huh. <clears throat> cool. Um, it's funny that this is uh, this actually links in really well. Tomorrow morning, we're doing a part one of a two part workshop where um, with the teens, you were doing advanced audio. So first, we'll be like playing nice high quality audio. Uh, assuming that I can get it working, uh, they send us a workshop. Done it yet. <laughs> uh, well, the thing is, I'm going to be doing prep for it tonight. Uh, but he wants so Paul, the creator of the teens, he wants the first experience of like really putting it together to be uh, live because they run it as a workshop with like lots mm -hmm. of rehearsal and stuff. But this could be a bit of a challenge, and I'm hoping it will be excellent. Uh, but uh, we'll open. probably have some surprises or two. Oh, there'll be glitches. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the Teensy is way more powerful than uh -huh. the Arduino. So you should be able to make fantastic sounds with uh, that. Yeah. So first we're going to be doing like playing music through it. And then like, I guess next week or something, or maybe even this week, it's going to be like uh, running that sort of in multi-threading with other processes so they don't interfere. But audio, electronics. Yes. Awesome. Super exciting. So um, on sort of a different note, uh, you mentioned so the TV be gone is sort of part of a you know uh, weaning humanity off of uh, television and like getting your attention back on the real world. Would you say that's accurate? I don't well, know. I don't know about all of humanity, but you know, <laughs> sure, I, yeah. I made one for me because I'm a TV addict. Right. I mean, we were talking earlier when we were eating at Cancun burritos uh, uh -huh. about our childhoods and how they weren't so wonderful. Um, good burritos. Um, yeah, uh, you know, being afraid of people and whatever. So uh, I was beaten up, bullied every day, and I would retreat to television. Mm. And it's highly addictive. Yeah. So uh, while watching TV, I could forget momentarily while I was watching, anyways, how horrible my childhood was. Mm. And um, uh, and I wasn't learning how to deal with people. I wasn't learning how to eat well. I was eating junk food like we're showing on the commercials mm. and it was available in my mom's house and um, I was getting fatter and unhealthier and not doing anything physical and making myself more of a target. So yeah. I would be bullied more in school and I'd withdraw all the more in TV when I got home, etc. Yeah. And one day I just went cold turkey and got rid of all my TVs. And I had a lot because I'm a geek and I'd take them in and broken yeah, ones and fix yeah. them up and I had a wall of them, but that was kind of fun. But um, uh, that's another story. I got rid of them and uh, then I had lots and lots and lots of time. Yeah. Which was horrible because I had to deal with all my <laughs> stuff, but it was only horrible at first because I got to deal with all my stuff. Yeah. And uh, well, start to, it's a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And uh, start learning how to live a life. 
I remember around the when uh, no or not Noah Swartz, Aaron Swartz, unfortunately, um, all that went down. Uh, there was a big conversation among the geek community about depression among uh, nerds and geeks. And uh, have you um, are there any resources that you would recommend, especially or like ways that um, you would recommend that people seek help or uh, or work together to improve this? Well, I, I wish there were one great place yeah. I could send people. Um, you know, there's uh, so many of us who are lost because uh, they took their own lives and uh, uh, they get rid of the pain, I presume. And I can totally relate. Uh, I've thought about it a lot. I never actually tried to kill myself. Uh, I was always too afraid. But some people, for whatever things that adds up to that, uh, a friend of mine um, who was the founder of Diaspora killed himself, Ilya. And uh, after that, I, uh, you know, taking anything, any experience, I want to use it for making my life and those around me better if I can. Yeah. So everything can be an opportunity. And um, even if it totally sucks, uh, I use that as an opportunity to get people to talk about this stuff. And so I, I had a Geeks and Depression panel at 28C3, mm -hmm. 28th Chaos Communications Congress in um, so four years Berlin now. at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and that, that seems to have helped a lot of people. So just getting people to talk with each other so that um, we don't feel as alone yeah. with our suffering is helpful. It's not, it's not it. It's not the magic bullet, but you know, if if we actually have community, mm -hmm. we have to be able to embrace people for all of who we all are. Yeah, you know, whether it's because we're depressed and don't feel like talking about it, we're ashamed about it, we're ashamed of whatever in our lives, sexuality, mm -hmm. gay, straight, whatever, uh, body issues, all these different things in our culture that um, we grow up feeling too ashamed or afraid to talk about. If mm -hmm. we can't talk about these things in our communities, our communities won't be really good. So just having a community, each hackerspace or and conferences, whatever, we can talk about these things makes it more welcoming so we can all heal some of whatever, and all of us have stuff to heal in our mm -hmm. childhoods and, and adolescence and, and whatever. Um, but we can also just grow into better people and yeah. support each other into growing whoever into whoever we are and whoever we're becoming. So um, there's Blue Geeks Online, which I don't know how active it is. Um, there's also all sorts of therapeutic uh, methods available, mm -hmm. some of them <clears throat> for free, depending on where you live in the world. Um, yeah, and uh, some of them more and less invasive. Yeah. And some with drugs, some without. And, you know, there's different things that are better for different people. Yeah. But the main thing is to not be alone. Yeah, definitely. In what you're going through. That's, um, that was one of the big points for me was feeling like I didn't have other nerds to relate to. Or I didn't think of it as nerds, but like, well, nerd was a bad thing. Well, yeah. You're well, a nerd. I was never even called a nerd. I was just, I just knew that I was more comfortable being sort of alone with, you know, teaching myself stuff. And I thought maybe I'm just like asexual and, uh, you know, misanthropic or something. <laughs> but it turns out I just hadn't found my people until I was like, you know, already in high school. And um, once you learn to find, learn how to find the people who, who relate to you at least on an intellectual level like that it's like your life changes for me anyway obviously you know not everyone can um solve their problems i still have problems obviously but <laughs> at least i'm, I'm better at hiding them or like yeah, well, working it's like a it. lifetime trip yeah totally everyone's a work in progress but um fortunately we get to collaborate on these projects they yeah, collaborate us. on yeah the projects that are us the yeah. project and these are great excuses for yeah. coming together with people um whether it's through brainwave stuff or music or uh, geeky stuff in hacker spaces whatever realms those are yeah it's just an excuse for coming together in community so we can be with our people yeah and you know and it's great to find a community of introverted geeky nerds and mm -hmm. dorks and People, we don't have to feel like we're being <laughs> judged for who we are. And you don't have to worry about getting excited about stuff because you'll seem <laughs> weird and geeky and nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh boy, I'm killing the web. Oh man, I'm just going to wave soldering. Oh man, it's our face. It's magic.
magic. It's not our face. It is magic, it but is. also, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's magical so. when you find stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so anyways, like the, you asked about the TV stuff and oh, yeah. uh, that's, you know, it's like uh, I got rid of my TV and I, I haven't had it since 1980. Dang. And when it's, yeah, it's helped me so much. I have uh, time to do the things that are actually worthwhile. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I'm missing a whole bunch of things that might be sort of worthwhile on TV. But for, for myself, anyways, everything yeah. I'm missing on TV, I'm finding things that are way more worthwhile mm -hmm. in life. So, um, yeah, so. I made TV be gone for me because yeah. when they were popping up everywhere in public places, I couldn't do anything, but I figured out a way to turn them off. Yeah. I did lots. Just And back then, that was 93 when I first thought of it. Uh -huh. uh, and didn't actually make time to actually work on it and make it happen <laughs> until 2003, 10 years later. Uh -huh. But even in 93, I would ask people if they could turn it off. Even if uh -huh. I was the only one in the place and yeah. no one was watching it, not the people who own the place or whatever. <laughs> Is. Everyone's just like trying to talk to the pe person across from them, but your gaze is like going. Oh, I can't help it. Yeah, right. Yeah, I just. Me neither. It, if it's it's flickering, it, yeah, I uh -huh. just can't help it, even if the sound's off. But I would ask if I could turn if, if they could turn it off because it's up in the corner. Yeah. Um, and they would always look at me like I'm just like some asshole freak. And uh, uh, yeah. So, anyways, I just made TV on so I could turn them off. No mm. need to ask. I mean, I actually am an asshole freak, but I also don't like TVs, so it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that side. Of <laughs> uh, so. yeah. uh, oh man, I was gonna say. Uh, da, 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 da. What were you gonna yeah, say? Yeah. So, anyways, <laughs> the, 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 making them available for other people so they could turn them off, I thought uh -huh. was a cool idea. And yeah. Because a lot of people did. I think a lot of people buy it because they. Uh, like messing with people mm -hmm. but whatever when a tv turns off i think it's always a good thing because yeah. it gets people to just look for, for a brief moment yeah. think about tv and it's it's a choice to turn it on or off and even if you're all just going like what happened to the tv you're talking to other people for a second at least a second <laughs> and quite often much more uh -huh. because usually people don't even notice because it's just noise that they already tuned out yeah and when it turns off they're not even aware they just feel better yeah so, and then if it turns on again, then I turn it off again. Uh -huh. <laughs> Maybe back and forth sometimes. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, again, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't want to tell people what to do and what not to do. Yeah, but I do like giving people uh, a way of thinking about, cheers, people thinking about, um, you know, doing things by choice. Mm -hmm. The more we do things consciously, I think the better for everybody. And yeah. we have to make our own choices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a society, a society, of course, we're making certain choices. Like, I remember <coughs> a long time ago, we had this talk about, um, I was reminded of this a minute ago, uh, about when the, uh, the World Series happened and fans of like fans from San Francisco who were excited about us winning torched a bus and then the next day there were all these buses going around saying go Giants on them like and you pointed out that that was ridiculous like like these are publicly funded things and like it's a private organization doing this um since we've got you know the Super Bowl taking over the city this weekend you know so um so it's clear that you know something is silly about the public funds going to like these organizations and stuff where do you think are obviously hackerspaces uh are deserving entities but they often also prefer to um operate as much as possible uh sort of independently although public funds and donations and things are sort of a part of the the ecosystem um for some yeah are there any other like uh public organizations or things that you think are more worthy of taking public funding? Like, where should where should the money go? I guess, you know, we supposedly live in a democracy. It would be nice if people got to choose. Yeah. Um, the, the problem is we have, uh, we're also easily manipulated by the mass media that mm -hmm. uh, impinges on our lives in so many ways, which is one of the reasons why I make TV be gone, to at least limit <laughs> <laughs> one of them. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, we're all easily manipulated into supporting the things that uh, profit large corporations. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, there, but it would be great, I think, if people um, found communities that 
they fit into mm -hmm. uh, and uh, start new ones that they that are doing the things that uh, they want if those don't already exist mm -hmm. or if they're not doing it in the ways they want. I mean, San Francisco is three quarter million people. That's yes. just San Francisco and there's millions in the Bay Area. Yeah. We only have 25 hacker spaces in the Bay Area <laughs> and, and that's not enough for everybody. That's true. So <clears throat> clearly we need more different kinds of communities for different people. That's a great point because we do have we've got you know the, the feminist one and the mothers based one and the biohacking ones and stuff and even so like <clears throat> better than just like throwing money at something that you think could be better is just like creating your own. That's such a great point. Yeah, and that's how they all happen. Yeah, you know? right. It was just me and Jake who started Noise Bridge, uh -huh. and then you know, of course it couldn't happen with just two people. I mean, <laughs> and all these other people came together, and uh -huh. it, it collectively. Um, uh, we, we created it, and that's true with all hacker spaces. Mm -hmm. But it all starts just with some person or a couple people, or small, small group with a vision, and they collect more people, and then it happens. That's true. Yeah, the Ann Arbor <laughs> one is where how I first got involved, and that was mainly Bilal. Yeah, um, Bilal was uh, yeah. the person who put it out, but then, <laughs> you know. But then Amanda and, and Xander and um, yeah, great really people. people. Anyway, that's really amazing. Have you great space. Yeah. <clears throat> Have you co started any other hacker spaces? I guess we're uh, talking about Mill for a second there. Um, Norton Imperial Labs oh, like for a very short period of time. <laughs> right, we were both part of that. That never really coalesced. Um, yeah, I'm but not I sure kind of why. Like see you as this Johnny Appleseed <clears throat> of the world, like spreading the, the message. Yeah, well, I, I poke people you know, <laughs> out of space, and it's like, just do it, do it, do it, do it. And, then, <laughs> and then they do. So um, yeah, I give talks about it. You know, there's that TEDx Brussels talk few years ago that I gave. Mm. That we'll find helped. a link to it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a good one, I think. I'm not, it's not my best talk, but <laughs> anyways, um, uh, the content's good and that helped people start spaces. And as I go around and giving talks uh, at fledgling spaces or for people over Skype or in person mm -hmm. to share my, uh, share my experiences, because, uh, you know, starting, helping start NoiseBridge with a bunch of people, we, we learned a lot yeah. through the process and <clears throat> communities hard work always. And um, uh, there's Especially always a community be, of like nerdy introverts, but well, once every, we find our people. Yeah, I mean, even if it's your people, there's gonna be um, uh, all sorts of things you have to deal with. You know, yeah. we're all human and we carry our stuff with us and there's gonna be disagreements and misunderstandings and sometimes conflicts. And sometimes they're difficult and yeah. stressful and you're wondering why you do it, but then you get over it and things grow stronger and better as a result. And you're mm -hmm. constantly reminded why it, as long as the work you put in comes back many fold, yeah. um, it works well for everybody. Mm. So uh, anyways, I learned a lot through that. <clears throat> I share that with other spaces and they all go through their own uh, processes and we share notes. I learn from them. They learn from me. I carry that and I can just, keep, um, as I travel, and I travel a lot, um, uh, help people uh, with, you know, I can't tell them what to do, mm -hmm. uh, but I can share my experience and what's worked well and what's not worked so well for others. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's helpful a lot. And uh, like in China, <clears throat> the government there really wants to, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, really wants to push hackerspaces as, yeah. as a means of social change for the better to encourage people to try things rather than be timid and um, just do what you're supposed to do, which is really interesting that this is happening It's China. really, yeah, as it's sort of co-existing uh, with this crackdown on um, VPNs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, I mean, we could talk about <laughs> China for a while if you want to, but, um, you know, the in-party fighting over there is yeah. very, very similar to our government. Huh. Here we call them two parties, but even yeah. within the parties, there's infighting because the Democrats and the Republicans aren't monolithic. Our yeah. US government certainly isn't monolithic. Yeah, no. And there's people within government that just hate each other. <laughs> and the Republicans and the Democrats <laughs> definitely do hate each other. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, you're in power and I want to be there. So the hell with you. And um, yeah. um, But um, it's really similar, except they're all called one party in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people running the internet are sort of the opposition of the people who are at the head of government now. Huh. And they're making the internet worse, as many other aspects of government there are getting better. But of course, it's still 
it's a huge centralized government, which is never going to be 100% good and mm -hmm. quite the contrary. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, but China, which has had, you know, like over two millennia history uh -huh. of autocratic rule um, and conflict and not necessarily for the betterment of their citizens mm -hmm. is now um, the top, it's a top down kind of place and the top down is pushing for people to uh, come together in community grassroots from the bottom up which wow. I think is just fantastic. Wow. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. At least that's part of what's happening there. Uh -huh. And they want that as one of the ways for their government to start, uh, I'm sorry, their economy to start to grow because uh -huh. the manufacturing over there will continue, yeah. but it can't be the thing. No. It has to be a whole bunch you. of people doing cool things that the actual innovation happens. So yeah. they're coming up with cool things that are good for their local area yeah. and then people in China will want it because it's good for them. Yeah. And, and it's so important to living and yeah. So they see it for that. And they also see it as a way for um, things to move forward in a positive way rather mm -hmm. than just doing well. So you can do well on tests. So you can get into the best universities so you can get a job in the bureaucracy so you can yeah. push papers all your life until you're dead. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, getting community buy-in and like having things made for the people who are living where they're being made is so important. Are there any really interesting projects you've seen that uh, like th that work within their local ecosystem to make stuff better? Um, little things for now. So yeah. one of the examples, um, there's this guy Bunny Huang. Yeah, you know Bunny. He's amazing. Made the novena and the chumbi. Yeah, yeah exactly. Chumbi way back as a, and he's way into open hardware. Uh -huh. He's done so much for open hardware. He even got an EFF Pioneer Award for that, which is, this is and he deserves it. Uh -huh. um, he, he has uh, been sharing a lot about how to do, uh, how to create, use China's resources to create your project and turn uh -huh. it into a product. And uh, I've been doing that in, in my own ways, and he's been doing that in, in really big ways. And um, he's also uh, written a lot about uh, the Shanzai uh, uh, community and sort of system there. And that's the name given to the copycat industry huh. in China. And it's, it's matured a great deal over time. Um, <clears throat> it started off being just, ex you know, they look like exact, but really poor quality copies uh -huh. of things that are popular in the West. And then sense. they sell it to the West. Mm -hmm. So now they um, have gotten way beyond that, and they've uh, it's essentially turned into an open source community. That's really interesting. Without licensing, huh? So they there are some people that specialize in like chipsets for phones, uh -huh. and other people for uh, touchscreens, and other people for firmware of this and radios, and and uh, not just phones, but uh -huh. many many other things. And because all of these resources are available, they see that you know people actually want. A mobile phone with more than one SIM card slot. Yeah. So they make ones with two or four or five. Yeah. And now you can huh. buy uh, brand name ones that have uh -huh. that. But it was innovated there. Yeah. And for the Chinese people, not for anyone else. <laughs> That's so cool. And it's kind of like how a bunch of you know people, you know, the Western hackers got started. Like a lot of us just started out by, like. Um, you know, reverse engineering stuff. We're trying to duplicate things that we saw that we thought were cool. Um, I, I think it took me a lot longer, but a lot of people who uh, went through engineering or whatever, they were like, "I could make that," and so they did. And like, it's sort of the same as the, you know, um, that counterfeiting. That's sort of yeah, yeah. And so the Shanzai—that's what they call it—is um, huge there now, and it's not oh. just copying anymore. It's not much of that even anymore. It, uh -huh. They're coming up with their own things and totally legal. They're not That's violating so cool. intellectual property law anywhere in the world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and cool stuff's coming from that. And then at Hackerspaces in China, people are coming up with all sorts of interesting projects. One of the biggest problems that China faces now uh -huh. is uh, the air pollution. Yeah. It's horrible. It took me a month after coming back from China to stop feeling my lungs. And you're not supposed to feel your lungs. No. So yeah, this is something that is a serious problem over there. Um, and this isn't a solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is, is difficult to solve. It's yeah. getting at the sources of the pollution. But it's something we have to contend with now mm -hmm. if you go to China or live in China. So there are a lot of people coming up with really 
cool, inexpensive ways to uh, have air purifiers. Uh -huh. And then having workshops for it so anyone can come and have their own air purifier that you have in their apartment that doesn't cost much money, mm -hmm. which is really important in China because uh, the economy there is uh, uh, one sixth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, six of their currencies to one of ours. And, uh -huh. um, so it has to be really inexpensive for people to be able to use it. And they've come up with a lot of ways to do that. Uh -huh. And some of them have created companies for doing this as well. Mm -hmm. And there's some that have come up with uh, pretty interesting kitchen implements. Uh -huh. And uh, they're mostly for people who cook with wax, like in China, uh -huh. and things like that. So oh, cool. it's a lot of cool stuff that's just now beginning uh -huh. because people are knowing that they actually have permission to explore and try yeah. things without the, the cultural shame that goes along with failing over there, which is even stronger than in the West. Yeah, we definitely have that. Um, trying to write a blog post about people getting started hacking, and I find that, like, at least half the post is now about like your mental state and being like, don't feel like you have imposter syndrome. Like everyone's got imposter syndrome. You know, I can't do. just say don't have it and have it be magically gone. But like, yeah. <laughs> Whoa! I'm the best hacker in the world. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, mental states uh, and just like you know the the will to iterate on stuff and like one prototype is better than a thousand designs and things like that. You know. Just, just make it. Just yeah, just it. do it. Yeah. You know, seriously, yeah. you know, we all have ideas. Yeah. And uh, ideas really are worthless in themselves. We all get them. Mm -hmm. Everybody does. It's just you focus on them. Do you do something about them? Do you use them as inspiration to try and experiment and, and just do stuff? So, um, you know, and uh, some ideas are worth following and some aren't. It's up to each of us what we do with those. Yeah, but it's also up to each of us which ones are important. Like for me, the, the little helicopter is very important, and maybe uh, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. And for California, solving the drought is important. For China, solving the pollution is important. Mm -hmm. like that, yeah. Awesome. This seems like a good place to wrap up. How do you feel? Do you have anything uh, you want to tag on? Is like a stupid thing? Um, <clears throat> God, what can I say? Um, <laughs> now it's now it's pressure. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, what we were talking about is one of the points I really like to uh, stress. You know, it's like, uh, it's up to each of us to, um, to choose what we do with our time. And, uh, you know, there's all these social pressures and internalized pressures of what we think or believe or not even think about that we're supposed to do with our lives mm -hmm. and whatever our economic class or um, racial, cultural, whatever uh, we, there's, uh, if you don't think about it and just live by default, your whole life is already set out before you, before you're even born. Yeah. And whether you're a boy or a girl or, uh, or other, um, it uh, plays into it. We can go along with that if we feel like that's what we want to do, uh -huh. but we don't have to. It's not always easy to do something different. Um, myself, and it sounds like you too, being introverted and geeky and scared of people. And as little kids, um, I was beaten up for it. There was no way I could do what I was supposed to do. Uh -huh. I tried. I thought people would like me if I did, but it didn't help. I was beaten up anyways. <laughs> yeah. um, so I had to put a life together for myself. Um, and maybe in that respect, I was actually lucky in a way. Um, I was forced to put together my own life. But anyone has the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. What do you do with your time? Of all the things you can be doing right now, and I could be doing right now, we choose to be here talking to each other with a video recording us <laughs> yeah. and a microphone off to the side and, uh, and a bag of geeky little kits that people can make and whatever. I mean, these are the things I choose to do with my time because I really love it. And, um, and because I've been choosing what to do with my time, I find things that I really like to do and things that are worth pursuing out of the infinite number of things to choose to do. Some work out the way I plan, most don't because uh -huh. I'm not good at predicting the future. Um, <laughs> but I see what happens and learn from it. And now I know more and now I can make more choices, hopefully better. 
And like, people see you doing that and they're like, this guy likes doing this and he's good at it. So we'll make him do that more or invite him to do that more. And then you get to just like end up doing things that you love because you're doing yeah. them. Yeah. And then now people pay me to do what I love, yeah. you know, and like TV gone, I just bumbled into that and I've been there for 11 <laughs> years, the last 11 years to do what I love and, and doing these workshops, going around the world, uh -huh. talking about hacker spaces, helping people with hacker spaces. I mean, I live like I'm this total jet setter, rich person. And like, <laughs> I make hardly any money, but I live as if I'm rich. Yeah. Because know? the point of being rich is to be able to do what you want. But so many people spend so much time being rich that, you know, or or staying rich or whatever. Exactly, I mean, yeah. Like, what's the point? Yeah, like I, I don't do what I do to be rich. I do what I do because I love doing what I do, and um, uh, that's the point. And so uh, we all have that ability. Yeah. And it's not always easy, but it's not easy to live a life knowing you're doing things you don't love, or things you don't like, or things yeah. you hate. And yeah. um, you know, it's not like. I still have to do laundry, you know, <laughs> but I like, I love having clean clothes, so yeah. it's worth it. Um, I still have to do bookkeeping and paying taxes. I like not being in jail. Yeah. Um, and uh, so life is full of trade-offs, but uh, given the circumstances, what do you choose to do? It's totally up to each of us. Well, I'm really glad that we chose to do this today. <laughs> Me too. Thanks. <laughs> so rad. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for uh, watching this Future People.